At this point, I'd like to invite Hamilton College Assistant Professor of Government Peter Canavo to introduce tonight's speaker. Well, when Paul Hatcher asked me to introduce Ralph Nader, I was I was honored, and then I realized this wouldn't be an easy task because Ralph Nader really needs no introduction. Um, he's a household name in America, a tireless uh, consumer and environmental advocate since the 1960s, and most recently he was the Green Party presidential candidate um, in 2000. If I were to actually discuss all of his activities and accomplishments, um, he would never get to speak. Um, we'd be here for the next few days. Um, but I'll say a bit about him, um, maybe just to reintroduce you. Um, He's a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Law School, and he first became widely known in the mid-1960s with Unsafe at Any Speed, a book he wrote on the um, dangers of uh, automobiles. And um, the book and his work for um, auto safety regulations earned him the ire of General Motors, who um, uh, sent out private detectives to harass him. Um, it also earned him the admiration of the American public. Um, uh, Mr. Nader went on to nurture a whole generation, I would say, of activists working um, to fight unresponsive government, corporate corruption, um, consumer hazards, and environmental <coughs> abuse. And in 1971, he founded Public Citizen, which is now an umbrella organization of over 150,000 uh, people who are working on consumer, energy, environmental, campaign finance, international trade, and healthcare issues. It's not just uh, works, doesn't just work on consumer and environmental issues. He also helped establish the uh, college campus based public interest research groups known as the PERGs, um, which have been active in 23 states on working on environmental and consumer safety issues. More than that, um, we can thank um, Ralph Nader and, and his work um, as having played a key role in the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and in drafting environmental and consumer um, protection laws like the Safe Water Drinking Act. He's also written numerous books and has um, been in countless uh, public appearances um, this one just being one of many, many. Um, but aside from all these accomplishments, uh, Ralph Nader represents something, I think, even more significant. He is a foremost exemplar of an American tradition of progressive populism that goes all the way back to the revolution. And in an age of deregulation, globalization, big money politics, and the increasing commercialization of our society, um, and in an age when we're all too easily distracted by sensational trials, sexual scandals, and bared flesh at the Super Bowl, um, Ralph Nader calls our attention to the issues that will determine the future of our democracy. He speaks out against the growing subversion of our campaign system, our natural environment, our public discourse, and our, our democracy by the expanding and unaccountable power of the corporate sector and the politicians who are enthralled to it. And he works not only for consumers and the environment, but to promote democracy as more than a passive spectator sport. His activism embodies the idea that democracy is a partnership in which we need to work together to control the forces that would otherwise shape our lives. I would prefer to call Mr. Nader not a consumer advocate, but a citizen advocate. And he's never shied from controversy. His run for the presidency in 2000 was certainly controversial. It both enraged and inspired. Um, but in running, he put the Green Party on the national political map. And even more importantly, he brought issues of corporate power and government accountability to the public discourse. And tonight, he'll talk about a number of issues, including the environment, that were for example, notably absent from our president's recent State of the Union address. So whether or not you agree with Ralph Nader, he's sure to provoke and engage you. And without any further delay, I'd like to turn the podium over 
to America's foremost public citizen, Ralph Nader. charitably call pollution, which is really a cumulative silent form of violence to human beings, flora, fauna, the planet, the future. I used to study very late at Princeton, and uh, to put it mildly, I'd finish about four or five in the morning. And uh, I would walk back to the dorm and uh, on the campus in the spring, uh, in my sophomore year, there would be dead birds uh, with their little legs up, and obviously they weren't mutilated by cats. Something had killed them. And uh, with a simple epidemiological leap, I realized that the uh, afternoon before, the groundskeepers were spraying the trees with large hoses of DDT, so much that as we went between campus and classrooms, we would wipe ourselves like this. And so I went down to the student newspaper with a couple of birds. And I said, you know, there must be something here. I mean, this is unnatural. And uh, why don't you look into it? And the senior with his feet on the desk, leaning back, watch out for reporters who lean back and put their feet <laughs> on the desk, complacently told me that uh, Princeton has some of the smartest biology and chemistry professors in the world. If there's any connection, any problem, they would have alerted us. That alone was worth three credits. <laughs> because I realized it wasn't enough to know how to know. You have to actually move your knowledge base to another slice of reality, namely the spring. And you needed to want to do it. because. They weren't going to get any tenure out of it. They weren't going to get any publishing out of it. They weren't going to get a raise out of it. Some of them were already consulting with companies. And you have to have the will, the desire to do it. And we've learned that many times in our history, that it's not enough to have scientists around, or engineers around, or other experts around. They have to have a normative content to their knowledge. They have to want to connect knowledge to action, knowledge to care knowledge to producing a safer, uh, more sustainable uh, society. So that was one lesson I learned. And uh, the uh, second one was when I was researching unsafe and speed. It was all going to be on auto engineering deficiencies and the uh, supremacy of corporate pornography over engineering integrity. And then someone told me in Southern California, you better look into the smog situation. This is in the early 60s. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a professor at Caltech, Arlie Hagen-Schmidt, who has definitively discovered the connection between automobile emissions and photochemical smog. Until his discovery, the auto companies refused to concede or recognize or do any research uh, with what seemed to be an obvious connection of some kind. And at the time, you had Southern California enveloped in this kind of almost permanent cloud of pollution. When you came in on the plane, you could see uh, it covered. And a radio station did a whole series of uh, radio stories called The Breath of Death. Uh, people were really getting concerned. Children, asthma, respiratory ailments, elderly, uh, etc. <clears throat> and at the time, the city council a uh, man by the name of Kenny Hahn was writing letters to the auto companies. He said, what's up to you? And they would write back saying, nothing to it. It's just rumor. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're getting better and better anyway. And he gave me all those letters back and forth. 
And on that basis, I inserted a chapter in the book. In the process, I stumbled upon evidence that the auto companies through their trade organization were colluding to restrain the development and marketing of smog control devices on their cars. In other words, they didn't want one company to break out and compete. So what they really did was say, look, let's all agree not to compete. Uh, and then no one will give us any trouble. That's called product fixing. At the time, there had never been a product fixing antitrust case. So I went down the uh, antitrust the division, the Justice Department, and got them all around the table and laid out the case. And they brought it. And they uh, engaged in a consent decree where the auto company said they'd never do it again and they would break up this uh, collusive activity. At the time, I said to myself, why are they resisting? Don't they breathe? Don't their children breathe? What are the perverse incentives to place what is ostensibly a highly personal interest in their own health in a subordinate position to some sort of technological stagnation comfort or refusal to mess up their weekends by changing their uh, designs and having to rewrite their manuals and have a different interface with the public. To this day, I can't figure these people out. They are completely imprisoned in the corporate world in what's called situational non-ethics. Even against their ostensible personal interests. Uh, as a result, the 1960s were the ferment of the environmental movement. You had some bizarre situations like Look Magazine refused to cover, uh, they had a story ready on air pollution, and they refused to cover it because they had one issue a year full of auto ads. So they were maneuvering. When can we do this without losing the ads? Life Magazine had a big takeout on air pollution inversions at the time, Denora, Pennsylvania, LA, etc. But they were waiting for a big one where nobody could fault them from the industry, like some huge disaster. Yeah, you know, don't blame us. It's, everybody's doing it. Indentured media. Also at the time, the students were getting very upset with the environment, starting to really get to them. However, in the short-term phase, I remember speaking at a college in Ohio, uh, students came up afterwards and they said, you know, we've got this terrible polluter about two miles down the road, the air is bringing it to the campus, and we've, we've gone after that polluter for three straight weekends, nothing has happened. I said, well, that's a nice display of impatience. <laughs> Get ready for a longer battle. Then came Earth Day, April 1970, that put the environmental issue on the map forever. 1,500 coterminous events at college campuses, universities all over the country. It was the biggest news of the week, led the evening news. Students pulled this off. Senator Gaylord Nelson was their, their guru in Wisconsin. There are others involved, to be sure. But the level of intensity in that month of April, in putting up posters and banners and organizing and getting places and rallies and big square in Philadelphia and elsewhere, was astonishing. And it broke through. It was the greatest single event educating the American public on an important issue in American history. You know, maybe your parents, your aunts, your uncles were involved. Out of that came some uh, prominent environmentalists who were never known until then, one of whom was Barry Commoner, who uh, was then an uh, ecology and a biochem teacher at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and he's since moved to Queens College. And he graced the cover of Time uh, one week. And he, then he wrote a couple of very, very good books, which nobody reads today, because they haven't been just published, right? But they're classics. And one of them is called Making Peace with the Planet. And he developed a conceptual way of understanding uh, what we call pollution that allowed 
the reader to become much more heuristic, inquiry, and imaginative, and interested in the subject. And one of the binary frames that he put forward was the technosphere against the biosphere. The biosphere meaning the air, water, soil, three, a few miles deep around the earth, in which all life is sustained, very fragile margin around the planet. And the technosphere, meaning the assault of modern technology from pesticides to internal combustion engines, petrochemical plants, to nuclear power, waste, etc., going up against the ecosphere. Now, the ecosphere has an absorptive capacity. That's quite remarkable. But if we call it nature, we can abuse nature only so far. And then we abuse it further, and it turns on its abuse. We can only fish the oceans with these huge drag nets so much before species after species goes into a death dive toward extinction. We can only cut down so many trees in rampant clear cutting style before we get severe soil erosion, landslides, blockages of streams, and so on. And this is what, of course, ecologists always look for is the breaking point or the tipping point. This is the danger of global warming, whether we have already put irreversibly in place the process of greenhouse gas emissions that are going to uh, start melting the glaciers and changing the climate and, and in other forms affecting the ozone level and so forth with other chemicals, where even if we suddenly discover we've got to do something, and even if Rush Limbaugh suddenly discovers that we've got to do something as he is seen floating away in his radio <laughs> office building, it'll be too late. It would be too late. So this generation has the real responsibility. You know, you could have been born 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 300 years ago. You just happen to be born at a time when there are breaking points coming up on the horizon. Some have already broken. North Africa once was heavily wooded. It's now the Sahara. Northern Minnesota, heavily wooded. Wisconsin, virgin timber. Look at it now. Estuary is so contaminated you can't use the wildlife, the fish, the shellfish, E. coli. So there are people who are paying the ultimate penalty of uh, point of no return for them. 32,000 Americans die every year, according to EPA, from the pollution emitted from coal-burning plants. That's more than 10 times the death toll of 9-11. But it's a silent death, isn't it? It's a silent violence. They just die all by themselves in hospices, gasping for that last breath of air. So how, how do we make this issue compelling? It can be very abstract, very complex, very scientific, very industrial. How do you grab people? with this issue. If they're not, if they don't have their jaw on the emission pipe of an automobile. <laughs> the first problem is that if you go through life thinking, if it doesn't pinch, it doesn't hurt, then you, you're not really sensitive to environmental contamination. Because environmental contamination, short of a major exposure suddenly, like a radiation blast, is exactly that. It doesn't pinch. But it's hurting all along until it's too late. Cancer, respiratory illness, liver damage, so on. So this is the first threshold we have to overcome. The environmental pollution, while it may be aesthetically repulsive to us, doesn't present the anthropomorphic threat of stateless terrorism or a street mother. And therefore, it escapes our sensory vigilance. For example, carbon monoxide. You can't see it, taste it, 
Smell it, touch it, it's deadly. Same is true for many other toxins. So we have to, in fact, take this issue and raise it to a level of mental caveat and concern where we replace the inability of our senses to alert us in any large population sense, any of our senses, with mental alerts and awareness. It occurred to me years ago that there are two ways we could make a national program to diminish or eliminate or prevent environmental contamination and destruction. Almost like this. Here's the first one. If we could have proved that the environmental contamination of America was the result of an international communist conspiracy, <laughs> that would have worked wonders, even for the early Rush Limbos. <laughs> the second way it could have been done is really quite interesting, because as one philosopher at Boulder once said, David Hawkins, we should have stopped pollution because it was ugly. And that's the following. Suppose that there was a law requiring that all industrial air pollution had to inject in it, before it emitted through the pipes and the smokestacks, an indelible red dye. So as it floated over the metropolitan area, everybody was dyed red. Cars became red. Your clothes became red. Your hair became red. And let's assume this indelible red dye was totally non-toxic. It could be actually a nice vegetable, vegetable dye. How long do you think it would be, all of the things being equal, before we would have done something about it? So it's very much human psychology. It's very much how our senses don't react, how our mind reacts to get this thing underway. Human beings have dumped more contamination in the world in the last 80 years than the whole course of human history. Sometimes we don't make enough categories out of what do you mean by pollution. Let's try indoor pollution. Let's try the coal mines. The coal mines emitted very fine particulate coal dust from day one and produced a disease called coal miners pneumoconiosis. For 80 years, the coal and steel industry refused to do any work on this, attributed the gasping and the choking and the coughing to smoking or asthma rather than coal dust. In Britain, in the late 1930s, they discovered it was connected to coal dust, and they made it a compensable disease under <coughs> workers' compensation. But in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and until the mid-60s, the U.S. coal industry and the steel industry that owned coal mines, and their hired doctors, their company doctors, refused to admit there was any connection. I remember when I entered this controversy, I challenged them on a TV program. I said, you, you know, to be consistent, I said to my adversary in the debate, I said, could you please demonstrate to the audience the distinction between British coal miner lungs and American coal miner lungs? There must be some impervious here. It has escaped the medical sciences. Do you know how many people have died in the coal mines? How many, how many coal miners have given their life for their company since 1890 through that disease? 400,000. More than all the people in the U.S. killed in World War II. All the soldiers, sailors, air, no. 400,000. That's just one industry. So pollution is indeed a terrible way to describe a deadly weapon of mass destruction. Coal particulate matter. Well, the economists tell us uh, 
We have to find a system where we can internalize the externalities, which I thought GM did a pretty good job of in screwing up the carbon monoxide leakage in its Corvair and making people inside the car breathe it. <laughs> but what does that mean? <clears throat> That's another way of saying that you make the companies pay for their external damage for using our air, water, and soil as their private sewers. To make them pay so that they develop a, a calculus whereby they, they have to think, is this pollution costing us more or is preventing pollution cost us less? Now, this can be done in a number of ways. It can be done by taxation. It can be done by uh, assessing the technologies in a way where they're forced back in for, say, recycling, as some companies are now doing. But it's almost never done. It's really interesting. All the debate on tax reform, they talk about well, tax shelters and cutting the taxes to the wealthy and you know, what will the middle class benefit and earned income tax credit. We never step back and ask ourselves, what are we doing taxing work before we tax things we don't like very much? Like pollution. Like gambling. Like stock market speculation and other things. And of course, in taxing pollution, you change the economic calculation of these corporate executives in ways they understand. You can make a humanitarian appeal, you can make a patriotic appeal, but you make this, you basically say, look, you put this equipment in, it's a lot cheaper, or you're going to have to pay in lawsuits, and fines, and taxes, etc. It's interesting that even community appropriate has tended to work a little. When you go back home to your computer, check into scorecard.org, which was developed by the Environmental Defense Fund using EPA data from thousands of polluters in named communities all over the country, who have to fill out forms every year as to how much uh, of certain kinds, not all kinds, of contaminants they were putting into the environment. And Environmental Defense Fund made it understandable. They took all this mass data, and they made it so understandable that you could go, you could look up Syracuse, for example, or Utica, and they'll have the names of the companies, and, uh, and you can get a good sense of what is being emitted into uh, the environment. Well, that, surprising to us, actually reduced some contaminants because it became a community shame situation. You know, Freud relied on guilt and Jung relied on shame. And, uh, maybe shame is more powerful in our society than guilt. But you had these executives, these clients going to the golf course you know, you got the newspapers putting out all the stuff they're dumping in the lungs of their neighbors. It began to uh, get their attention. That still remains, of course, that it still remains to be seen how serious we are about this issue. And what we need to do in, in uh, a number of categories is, is the following. When you ask yourself, what changes the behavior of pollutants? Let's say the Department of Defense is a massive polluter at installations in this country. I think the latest figure is going to cost $300 billion for a modest cleanup. This is nuclear uh, weapons facilities, and like the Hanford Reservation up in Washington State. Uh, there is rather, on these military reservations, very reckless uh, behavior, especially in the 50s and the 60s, when they weren't under any kind of scrutiny or any kind of regulation. How do you change that kind of behavior? How do you change the behavior of corporations who will blandly say to anyone who wants to know that A, there is no connection with human disease, that's what the auto companies told us for years, and B, that there, even if there was, there was no technology that could prevent it other than increasing the price of the product X fold, and that C, uh, they couldn't do it without disadvantaging themselves vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. Well, 
Let me just give you a few categories of the kind of external change agents that can be tried. One is, of course, regulation. Regulation is a way of saying, these are the standards. If you don't meet them, you get shut down or you get prosecuted. These are the emission standards for motor vehicles, for petrochemical plants, for lead plant smelters, for copper smelters, and so on. This approach now is virtually finished. The laws are still on the books. The agencies are still there. But for the last 20 years, in a spectacular demonstration of attrition and relentless hammering, the corporations and their corporate law firms and their corporate PACs have de facto nullified the regulatory state here. I mean, there are nibbles here and there. Uh, but by and large, if you look at the base statute, most of them are a dead letter. For instance, uh, in the area of coal burning plants for the old plants, they're still hassling what to do. They were grandfathered under the air pollution law. And they're still operating. Why were they grandfathered? Because, well, they're old plants and they'll be put out and replaced with new plants with better control. So let them alone. Besides, the coal industry is pretty powerful to begin with. Well, they didn't. They found out that, hey, this is, this is a holiday for us. Let's keep repairing them and keeping them operating, but don't put in modern day scrubbers. The regulatory state under both parties in varying degrees of decrepitude is over. In fact, many environmental groups now are settling for threatening lawsuits, cajoling companies entering into private negotiations with them. The second approach is what might be called the Amory Lovins approach. He's a physicist, some of you know his work. And he believes in the sheer power of knowledge and corporate self-interest. He goes and he meets with electric utilities. He tells them, look, you can make more money by negawatting your, your operations rather than megawatting. In other words, instead of building new plants, which are very expensive and they're, they have zoning problems and they get community opposition and so on, and huge capital expenditures, put your money in energy reduction through efficiency. Uh, a megawatt you don't you you don't have to waste is a megawatt you don't have to build. And he had some headway there in some of the utilities. They realized they could make more money by conservation than by expanding the generation of electric capacity, giving homeowners incentives if they get more efficient uh, lighting systems or refrigerators or, or what have you, furnaces as well as improving their own operations. You know, the bulk of the energy that comes out of an electric generating plant is waste. It's waste heat. In fact, once I said that the main objective of an electric generating plant is to heat the heavens. You know, look at it clinically. And the conversion of energy combustion into actual work in the, in the motor vehicle itself is pretty dismal. So there's a huge opportunity here for energy efficiency. I remember once we had an engineering conference in the early mid-70s, right after the oil cartel and the boycott and all that. And I introduced the, uh, the conference and I said, you know, we could save at least half of our energy in this country if we just put in more efficient systems and put out the lights all night and did some personal things. And after a couple of the engineering and the fellows came up and said, where did you get that figure? So I gave him the side. He said, that's too conservative. And he started pointing out there's a building in Toronto that was using 25% of the energy that other buildings down the street were using in other pilot projects around the country. He said, huge potential here. And of course, this raises a very important uh, framework. Uh, to look at this. Pollution is essentially a result of inefficient utilization of raw materials. It is a form of bad productivity. And if we define the environmental pollution problem, among other ways, health, cancer, uh, so we define it as inefficiency. 
We will then use a standard that the companies have used against us, which is we can't clean up because it, it, it'll mess up our cost structure and increase our costs. And the other argument is, oh no, if you do it right, you will reduce your costs and pay your debt to the planet. And he would say, you know, you're just an armchair philosopher. You don't know what you're talking about. And we say, really? So why don't you go down to Atlanta, Georgia, and check in with Interface Corporation, which is the largest commercial tile and carpet manufacturer in the United States with plants here and abroad. And take a look at their cost reduction in their operations with every step that they've taken since 1994 in advanced recycling and pollution control. That's a big company. And it puts the lie to the other bigger companies about trying to juxtapose the situation where if they clean up, the product has to cost more and their profits will go down. Ray Anderson, who's the CEO of Interface Corporation, speaks like an engineering environment professor. Since 1994, he has sworn that his company is going to be the first in the world toward 100% recycling and no emissions. That's his goal. He's even ready to lease carpets. Now, High standards of performance within industry are not publicized enough. There's nothing more powerful than to throw a higher standard of performance by one company against another. In the oil industry, for example, uh, I enjoy throwing BP against ExxonMobil or other oil companies, Shell. Because the CEO of BP uh, which stands for British Petroleum, the third largest oil company in the world, wants BP to be known as Beyond Petroleum. He's a, he's a great solar energy advocate. And the first big oil executive who admitted to the existence of the global warming trend, this outraged his brethren in this tight little cartel that we know about. But he stood firm on it. Now this is another example of throwing an awareness, an admission, a recognition, and a transitional plan against other companies in the industry. Now, it doesn't always work that way, because we now have a rather spectacular example of fuel efficiency in motor vehicles. The hybrids from Toyota and uh, <coughs> Toyota uh, led, uh, led with it, and then Honda. They're going 50, 55 miles per gallon. The average fuel efficiency of new motor vehicles in our country is under 23 miles per gallon and dropping. It's the lowest in 22 years, largely because of the SUVs and light trucks and vans. But even the fuel efficiency of the cars, just the old-fashioned automobiles, is about half of what the hybrid is. So how come Detroit is dragging its feet. How come the conversion into hybrids is not as fast? People are waiting in line to buy them. Some of the cars are smaller than they like, but the hybrids are going to be getting larger year after year. Perhaps it's because the state, federal, and local governments aren't getting behind this. Perhaps because it's Japanese and they don't want to reward a foreign manufacturer. Whatever it is, here it is, right on the highway. You pass them every day. And it's not pushing. That's the level of resistance. Because the big money in the auto companies is not in automobiles anymore. It's in SUVs and light trucks. Far greater profit margin. They give you less, and you pay more. After all, what is an SUV? no classic advance in automotive technology, is it? Unless you like to roll over. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is another way to deal with, uh, with these people and the process? Recycling, recycling, programs like wood reduction, 
programs that reduce the amount of waste to begin with. I mean, some of the packaging is unbelievable in supermarkets. They package and they package the package and then they package the package of the package. <laughs> As Betty Furness, the consumer advisor to a couple of presidents, once said, walks into a supermarket and she buys oranges, which are packaged, wrapped individually, and then put on a tray with a plastic wrapping in a box. <laughs> and she said, get rid of all this stuff. Just leave the orange with its birthday suit that God gave it. <laughs> Recycle. Very common again in a, a project in one of the New York City south, uh, boroughs showed that uh, 80 to 85 percent of the waste could be recycled at a profit. But of course, New York City announced well, a couple years ago they were going to cut short on that. There's something wrong with the economics here. Something wrong with the, the assignment of short and long-range costs. You've got to think to get both of them involved. If you have life cycle costing to the products we buy, which take into account the long-range uh, contamination costs over the life of the product, it, you would have a different calculus to confront the companies with. They give you the benefits, they don't give you the long range cost. Now here's an example of medieval thought. And you want to look at medieval thought in America? Okay. Year 2004. Here it comes. We have a plant in the world that's the longest fiber plant that's ever been domesticated. And it was domesticated 5,000 years ago by the Chinese. It has over 5,000 known uses from lubricants, to fuel, to fiber for clothing, to food, to auto parts, you name it. It's a prime expression of what Thomas Alva Edison, Henry Ford, and the presidents of MIT and Harvard got together in an exciting new proposal to the American people in the 1920s. And here's what it was that what you can make out of hydrocarbon, you can also make out of carbohydrates. Therefore, instead of ripping the guts out of the earth with minerals, you take it off of our farms. And the prime example of that is industrial hemp, which has about one-third of one percent THC. And as I wrote to President Clinton and his drug czar, Brian McCaffrey, ex-general, that they could smoke a barrel of it every day and not get high, even if they inhaled it. <laughs> However, it's on the DEA band list. It has been since the 40s. Even though it was used in World War II for strong rope and parts of parachutes, even though it was grown and sold, not smoked, by George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, some of the drafts of the Declaration of Independence were made of industrial help. It makes extremely durable paper without cutting down trees, without having to use chlorine. Banned. We organized a whole coalition a few years ago. We petitioned the Clinton administration, get it off the DEA list. The farmers want to grow it. The commissioners of agriculture in states want it. Legislatures from Kentucky to North Dakota passed resolutions. Free industrial hemp, let our farmers grow it. The answer from Washington, no. So you start another argument. Well, Washington, don't you know that it's legal to in, import industrial hemp from China, Canada, France, Romania? We can import it and make food out of it and make Patagonia products out of it, but we can't allow our farmers to grow it. Why? The answer is because it's difficult for our agents to distinguish between industrial hemp and marijuana when we're searching for that mischievous 
drug. <laughs> so some Native Americans on the uh, Sioux Indian Reservation decided they wanted a little economic activity. They grew a few hundred acres of industrial hemp. And the feds in 2000, year 2000, got wind of it. One day, the Indian farmer was woken up by sounds of helicopters and bulldozers. This entire battalion jumped on his land and cut down all the industrial hemp plants with some of the agents quietly apologizing. What happens to marijuana when industrial hemp is grown side by side? Here's what happens. Industrial hemp dilutes marijuana. That's why the marijuana people in California do not like industrial hemp anywhere near. They're secret plots. You know, there's an area in Northern California that people have incredible leisure. And you say to them, don't you have a job? <laughs> Where'd you get the money to buy this Lincoln town car? It's the biggest single cash crop in California. They don't want industrial hemp because it dilutes. The latest attempt to squash industrial hemp was by the Bush administration. They wanted to restrict food imports made of industrial hemp. I once went to a banquet where the food was made of industrial hemp, from the appetizer to the dessert. It's good for you. Better than radishes. <laughs> now, what do we do to liberate this plant? Well, the former head of the CIA wants it legalized because it reduces our dependence on oil. Import, <clears throat> among other things. This is medieval thinking. And it's not an issue. Have you ever heard a single candidate talk about this? Yeah, me. <laughs> but other than that, I'll tell you how powerful the stigma is. The senator from North Dakota, Kent Conrad, has been urged to put in a bill in Congress legalizing industrial hemp growth in the United States since we can legally import it. The governor's behind it. The legislature's behind it. The farm economy is behind it. It's, it's hard to find anyone in North Dakota who is objecting to this, except the anti-drug lobby, which isn't that powerful in North Dakota. <laughs> he still won't put it in. Senator Conrad, we've been working with you for years. What do you need to know? He said, well, I'd like some uh, support from outside of North Dakota. Well, I said that's a nice bit of uh, anti parochialism I appreciate that. You are a U.S. Senator, after all. So we get letters from Interface Corporation, we get letters from Patagonia, all saying, we buy a lot of this industrial hemp for our, pro for our production. Still wouldn't do it. Medieval thinking. The displacement effect of industrial hemp once it gets underway, once the machinery is refined for the harvesting, etc. In terms of replacing hydrocarbon-based products, reducing the pressure to import oil, reducing uh, dramatically the need to use nitrogen fertilizer or pesticides, a very hardy plant, decentralizing its growth around the country, providing more income to farmers, on, on, on. And we're sitting watching this not go into effect because it has not entered the political arena as an issue of advocacy and obvious preliminary contention. Let's look at another issue here, which is your own future. If you're 20 years old, You've got 15,000 days or so before you turn 65, a little over 2,000 weeks. Did last week go quickly? <laughs> if you think it went quickly, you haven't seen anything yet. Ask some gray-haired people in the audience how fast it go. Now, what kind of world are you going to leave behind? What are you going to say when your grandchild, that bright, nine-year-old on your lap looking up at you when the glaciers are melting 
and says, Grandma, Grandpa, why you, what were you doing when you could have stopped this? You know how perceptive nine-year-olds are. You never want nine-year-olds to replace the White House president. It'd be perfect for all presidents. <laughs> what are you going to tell your nine-year-old? You're going to say, well, i got to tell you, Amy, in truth, I spent a lot of time watching the reruns of Friends. <laughs> Take the oceans now. We are the last generation, if we don't do anything, before the oceans start moving into irreversible modes of deterioration. That's what's being dumped in the ocean. That's what the crisis is of fishing in the ocean. That's what the destruction of the reefs and the littorals and the mammals. That's what's going to happen when the ozone is thinned out and strikes the biota in the ocean, the draining of oxygen from the ocean. That's why you're a critical generation. Now, you know, you can go through life. You're, you're in the top 3 4% of people your age in the world in terms of health, education, and the ability to make a difference. Most people your age today are worried about where they're going to get the next meal and how painful 22 inches of worm is in their gut. So you can go through life and enjoy yourself, maybe even escape the floods, because you can have a nice chalet in the Adirondacks or Catskills. You can go through life and live a nice private citizen life, raise your kids, go to church, send checks to the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. You're not awarding yourself enough significance. You're not putting on your backs the moral imperative that comes from your education and the country you live in, which can make more of a difference to the world than any other country. In short, you need to revolutionize the use of time. You just can't continue the routine that you're inheriting. You have to have time to be a public citizen. You're going to live, have your descendants live a comfortable, wholesome life as a private citizen. And that means in your education, you've got to look at your schooling as more than just a trade school. And that's what a lot of higher education is these days. Some of it is a very high-priced trade school. Some of it is not. Whether it's a law school, engineering, graduate school, medical school, computer science, it's vocational training. It's time for the liberal arts to have a higher status. In a small college like Hamilton, you have a higher status than in a large university for the liberal arts. Why the liberal arts? Remember that story about the, the uh, couple hundred uh, people who came to uh, Philadelphia in, 18, in 1787 to write our Constitution? And it was a big room. It was very hot. They didn't have air conditioning. And they sweated it out that summer. When I was studying that little episode, I didn't locate one of those people who was a stagecoach design and repair expert. Although they couldn't have gotten there without the stagecoach. Certainly not in time. There were people steeped in literature. Comparative government, jurisprudence, the frailties of politics. What happens when power is concentrated? Separation of powers. They knew their forebears wisdom, going right back to the ancient Greeks. Not much oriental wisdom, but they didn't have it then. This was very, very important to make this point. And that is, all this technology, they're just tools. They can be used beneficially or devastating. Take something that is not often used as an instrument of devastation. The computer. What do you think happens to us when we spend 
30, 40 hours a week looking at a screen. When we go home at night, we look at another screen. And we go to work and we're looking at screens. And we're so in love with screens that we want eight-year-olds in schools to go to school and look at screens. Maybe even seven-year-olds. There's some people say you should start in kindergarten. Put them in front of screens. Never mind their socialization. Never mind expanding their vocabulary. Never mind extending their attention span. Put them in front of screens. They've got to have an early start on computer literacy. After all, they're in a global competition with the Chinese and the Germans. Put them in front of screens. And what do they hear and see in front of screens? Do they learn how to think? Is this problem in education really one of acquiring more and more information? There's information overload. We don't have wisdom. We don't have judgment. We don't even have knowledge. We have bits of information. Bits of information are supposed to pull the student toward knowledge, toward judgment, toward wisdom. It would be overflowing with bits of information. Students today have a vocabulary that is so small, it could completely replace Esperanto <laughs> as a contemporary language. You know, sort of, kind of cool. You know, kind of, sort of, like, 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 like. <laughs> met a student up there in uh, Evergreen College, sophomore. She starts out in a discussion. We were in a circle. I counted 26 likes out of 60 words. I, and I interrupted her and chided her. At the time, she took it quite well, but she wrote me a letter chiding me. So I wrote her a long letter saying, I know it was discomforting. You don't want to go through life with every third word, like? What kind of psychological hesitation are you drowning yourself in? <laughs> Short attention span impedes reflection. It impedes observation. It makes one very vulnerable to manipulation. Madison Avenue and political ads are two examples of that. The eye is not designed to watch 60 changes of scene in an MTV, or 40 in a advertisement, or 30 a minute, even in a news account doesn't have time to register back to the brain, digest, and come back. In other words, it's swung at supersonic speed through these images. You start that at age two, you don't think that affects learning? You don't think that affects attention span? If Marx were alive today, he would say, television is the opiate of the people. And we've surrendered and turned the TV set into a babysitter, electronic babysitter. 30, 40, 50 hours a week, these kids under 12 are watching it or watching videos. And the poorer they are, the longer they watch, because their mamas want to keep them off the streets. They're more dangerous. So part of it, of course, is the mirror reflection of the environmental problem in the world is also the political mirror reflection. Why don't the politicians get down to work here? Why don't they take known solutions off the shelf and put them into effect? Isn't that what Jefferson taught us to do, that representative government is supposed to counteract what he called the excesses of the moneyed interest? Well, the usual explanation is that they're trading their campaign contributions for their integrity and their awareness of what must be done. So you know what their campaign contributions are? You know, like a couple billion dollars a year. Imagine the cost of that. Just think of the cost of environmental devastation in one day. That's why we need to have public funding of public campaigns. Public campaigns should not be for sale. Elections should not be for sale. Our representatives should not be for sale. Our government should not be for sale. Our childhood should not be for sale. The rampant expansion of corporate commercialism colliding against civic values and subordinating and destroying them 
is putting a for sale sign on everything that used to never be for sale, or at least limited sale potential. And this is what all the great religions in the world taught us. Do not give too much power to the mercantile interest. Because it's so singularly focused on profit that it runs roughshod over the competing civic values of fellow civilization. In our times, health, safety, environment, concern for posterity, nurturing of childhood, clean elections, accessible media, and democratic processes. So here we are, in a situation where once again we're hostages to two-party duopoly, with its electoral college, with its winner-take-all mentality that makes us only want to vote for winners, with its exclusions of competition from debates and from the ballot itself through huge hurdles that are placed before third parties and independent candidates. Even on the 19th century, when it was easier for third parties, they're the ones who led the way. Abolition of slavery, women's right to vote, trade union movements, populist farm progressive reforms, the greatest political reform in our history, in 1887 to the early part of the 20th century. We're losing the big ideas of small candidacies. And as a result, the corporations turn our government into a wholly owned subsidiary. Washington, D.C. is corporate-occupied territory. They put their executives in high positions at departments. They pour the money into the key congressional committees. 80% of all federal campaign money comes from business centers. They offer jobs to key legislators when they decide to retire and really cash in. They threaten to go abroad if we uh, put too much environmental standards on their back, bringing politicians to their knees, even though it could be completely false pretenses that they could do it and they could clean up. And we're all very bewildered by this because we grow up pretty powerless. From an early age, we're really taught in so many ways by our corporate culture. Forget it. You can't fight these powers. Just try to get a job, get a good standard of living, have fun, stick to your private citizen role. A few of us around the country and here say no to that. As a result, the level of lead is lower in your blood now than it was 20, 40 years ago because environmental activists pushed to get tetraethyl lead out of gasoline. You know the games that the oil companies play? In the 1920s, when they put lead in gasoline, they raised the price. When they were required to take it out a few years ago, that's what they did. They raised the price. There's less lead in the body of children, although poor children still get it from the lead-based paint peeling off crumbling tenement walls. There are a number of substances in people's bodies that are now far, far diminished. But we just heard today in the papers that EPA states that one out of six newborn children contain mercury that could harm their development. One out of six. Reminds me of a statement in the New York Times, one out of six people in New York City are uncertain of, of their next meal. Fairly rich city. Pesticides affect children more than they affect adults. The federal standards for toxics are for adults. They're not for children. It's as if, well, you know, they can grow into it. <laughs> the standards should be for children. You protect children, you protect adults who are less vulnerable. And as a result, the pesticide doses, the tolerance, are loading up on our kids who are very vulnerable at a very young age to these toxins. For a little respite, we have national parks. We spend less on managing the national parks than one aircraft carrier. In fact, you can almost make an argument it's not much more than a B-2 bomber. 
which the Pentagon doesn't even want anymore of before Kosovo, because it was, it was designed for the Soviet Union. And it was also a bit of a lemon. It had trouble flying in the rain. And yet the munitions industry pushed it on Congress, and pushed it on the Pentagon. Very inefficient way to fulfill the mission of a military aircraft is the V-2. Drinking water now in the deep Washington, D.C., they just discovered thousands of homes have unacceptable levels of lead. We pushed for the Drinking Water Act of 1974 and got it through with two provisions for the citizenry to use. One, all local drinking water systems are supposed to notify you in your household if they exceed acceptable levels of contaminants, such as arsenic, lead, cadmium. Number two, you should be able to call or write your local drinking water department and get the latest test results that they have to periodically make for the water that they ship to your faucets. Obviously, in Washington, D.C., the environmental groups flubbed it. They thought, good heavens, the nation's capital, the home of the EPA. How would this D.C. department dare cover something like this up for a year and fire the employee who blew the whistle on it? See what happens when people are not vigilant? It would have taken one person with a hobby. Let's say one person who has a bowling hobby decided, no more bowling hobby. My hobby is the DC water department. <laughs> Imagine just one person could have found that. It was no big secret. They could have asked for the reports, etc., which is their right under the law. If they couldn't get it, that's a signal there's a cover-up. Go to the newspapers, go to the TV. It wasn't done. If people do not pick their own injustice or injustice and work on it, who's going to work on it? Who's going to look out for the people if it isn't the people themselves? We have been lulled into a complacency that combines powerlessness on the one hand, manifesting as apathy on the other. It's as if we've got 100,000 people in a stadium and someone on the stage roars out, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the answer comes back in a crescendo, we don't know and we don't care. <laughs> well, here's what knowledge gets you. You know all the controversy about cutting uh, trees in our national forest? And now the, the timber companies, subsidized by you, you build their roads in our national forest. They do not pay a cent. There are as many roads in our national forest as almost the, high, the federal highway system in terms of miles. They rip up the roads. They cut the trees. They drag them down. They have erosion and silt, and they get into the streams, right? And then they don't pay us peanuts for the trees. Uh, 20 years ago, when I looked into this, a 250-foot magnificent spruce tree in Alaska was going for $2.50 to the U.S. Forest Service. I hear now it's, it's maybe five times that. Big deal. Giving away our natural resources is an incentive for them to plunder our public lands. Now, you see all this. And there's one fact that is really stunning. What percent of U.S. commercial harvested timber do they get from our national forests? And the answer is 5%. Get them out of there. These forests are not for warehouser and its phony ads. They are for your descendants to benefit from forever. That's what we should tell these people. And if they need timber for paper, we tell them, get over there and grow industrial hemp. <laughs> we'll just end on a couple notes here. GATT and WTO NAFTA, anti-environmental to the core. They set up a system of autocratic international governance, completely antithetical to our 
freedom of information laws are open courts. They have secret courts in Geneva. 140 nations belong to it. We do. It's federal law, and it can be enforced by the World Trade Organization or the NAFTA Secretariat. And what it did is it did not stick to trade. That's the rub. It said that any country that belongs to these trade agreements, whose environmental standards, consumer standards, and labor standards are deemed by another country to be restrictive of trade across national boundaries, can be hauled to Geneva and adjudicated in a secret court. Not in our courts, not in French courts that are open, a secret court. We signed on to this in the Clinton administration with very, very little deliberation in Congress and no amendments permitted. That's called fast track legislation. It was the greatest surrender of local, state, and federal sovereignty in our history. The majority of the American people were against it in polls. They smelled something fishy, bad, out of control, absentee control. They had trouble dealing with Tallahassee, Albany, and Washington, much less Geneva and closed courts. But the uh, fabled Eastern Press establishment, New York Times, Washington Post was for it. So were the corporate lobbies, and so was the Clinton administration. And they got it through. I remember reading the editorial writers in the New York Times. I said, you know, have you read this document? Blank response. No, I said, have you read the several hundred pages of this legislation. Tom Friedman, have you read it? They never will tell you that they have read it because they were working off memos summarizing it. So I said to the editorial writer who was constantly promoting it, I said, you know, you can't send New York Times reporters to those Geneva tribunals who are judging environmental, consumer, or labor issues even though they're trade Specialist judges, you know anything about these? Did you know that environmental, labor, and consumer standards and laws and regulations are subordinated to the imperatives and supremacy of international commerce? And you cannot send a reporter to that tribunal. You will be barred. You know what he told me? He said, it's worth the price. I said, for who? The New York Times or the people of the world? It's worth the price. So we decided to do something innovative. We offered any member of Congress who could sign an affidavit stating that he or she had read the entire GATT proposal before the vote in Congress and answer 10 questions in, in public. We would make a 10,000 contribution to their favorite charity. The first deadline was on Friday, 5 p.m. Nobody called. So we extended it for a week. Order five in our office, ding a ling a ling. Who is it? It's Republican Senator Hank Brown from Colorado. Yes, Senator, what can I do for you? Well, I've read your challenge. I don't want you to send anything to my charity, but I'll take you up on it. How long do I have before the test? And I said, well, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, the, the, the vote's coming up in a month. So we were availed of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee room. We were up there with the senators, and the senator was in the, in the chair. And we asked him 12 questions. And he got everyone right, proving he had read it. And I said to him, well, congratulations. He said, well, I want to say something. They're fine, he had the TV, the newspapers there. He said, I'm a free trader. I voted for NAFTA. But after reading these pages, I'm appalled by the autocratic, anti-democratic nature of its provisions, and I'm going to vote against it. And you know what? To this day, he's the only member of Congress who ever has read that agreement that cost us more local, state, and national sovereignty than any other treaties in our history. And his example did not change one additional vote in the Senate. And they called it a trade agreement, not a treaty, so they didn't have to get two-thirds vote. And they got away with it. 
So now, if you have an ordinance here in Clinton, and you decide that you're going to ban a certain chemical that's imported, the company that's exporting it to the U.S. can go to its government, take the U.S. to the tribunal, and you would not have anyone representing you, and your state attorney general couldn't represent you, only the U.S. attorney general, in a closed courtroom, no press, no citizenry, no transcript, no independent appeal, kangaroo courts. And if they decide against this Clinton ordinance, you are going to be under tremendous pressure to repeal it. And if you refuse to repeal it, you'll be taken to court by your own national government. And if the U.S. refuses to repeal it, they have to pay that foreign country tribute, a fine, until the U.S. is in compliance. We've had five out of five of environmental regulations and standards challenged by foreign countries. We've lost all five before the tribunals in Geneva. And that's just for starters. The squeeze of the WTO and NAFTA is slow but relentless because they don't want to go all at once because it would be a re revolt against them. There are hundreds of laws in our country that are considered by other countries trade restrictive and violating NAFTA and the WTO. And we think there are hundreds of laws in their countries, Japan, Western Europe. The homogenization of standards under these trade agreements is such that we cannot be first in the world anymore. We have to go to harmonization committees that are also closed doors under WTO and NAFTA. Now, I don't want to burden you with such dark clouds here. But I, I do want to suggest that we've got a lot of work to do with young people, with older people, with our scientific and engineering establishment, with our universities, with our regulatory agencies, with our higher standards of performing companies who should be more aggressive in touting what they've done to shame and embarrass their corporate brethren. We've got to do it for the simple reason that there's no more efficient technology in the world than the biosphere. And it was given to us free. You know, you've heard the phrase, no such thing as a free lunch. What do you think the sun is? 95% of our energy comes from the sun. The rest is coal, oil, gas, wood, and so on. If we can just take the rest of that sun in terms of photovoltaic and thermal and biomass and other wind power, other manifestations, we can replace in perhaps the best universal sovereign at our fingertips over a period of years a great deal of the fossil fuels that are creating acid rain and global warming and so much damage to land, air, water, health, food, and our genetic inheritance. The sun is the closest thing we have to a universal sovereign. And we ought to take advantage of it. I can assure you, if ExxonMobil owned the sun, we'd have solar energy very quickly. <laughs> There's a group that is active here called Kids Against Pollution. Anybody here? There they are. They're very good. Leading the future. There's the genius of the third world. Why do we think we have the monopoly of science and technological? No. Any of you ever hear of Hassan Fatshi, the people's architect in Egypt, who passed away about 14 years ago, as disciples around the world? He taught illiterate Egyptian peasants how to build elegant little homes from the soil under their feet. Talk about a sustainable product. Industrial hemp is very degradable. The auto companies are starting to use industrial hemp for auto parts. That's how strong it is. The genius of the third world is often old knowledge. The knowledge of the neem tree in India. The knowledge on how to contour their lands in ways that reduces soil erosion and that devastation to farm production. There's a lot of old knowledge. The old naturalists of the Amazon who are dying, the indigenous tribes, spectacular practical knowledge. 
some of the drug companies are trying to tap into it now to extract their knowledge before it's too late. We ought to use this as part of our foreign policy instead of shipping deadly weapons around the world. Why don't we, why don't we hold our hands out and exchange life for knowledge and technologies around the world? Let me end on this note. I'm going to leave in a library. Uh, this, this book's called You Can't Eat the GDP. <laughs> Economics as if Economics as if Ecology Mattered by Eric Davidson, who is uh, at the Woods Hole Research Center, not far from here, in Massachusetts. How many of you heard of Julia Butterfly Hill? This is her book. She spent about two years living up in a giant redwood that she called Luna to save it. Just think, wind, storm, night, day, harassment by the timber companies. She was up there almost two years, giving interviews on her cell phone. And, and imagine the ups and downs of that. This is her story. She was 23 years old about. She is now a national figure. This is what she had to do to become a civic celebrity. How do you become a civic celebrity? Do you do good studies? Do you organize neighborhood groups? Do you succeed? No, no. Go up into a tree. That's what you got to do for two years. More and more extreme sacrifices in order to get access to our simple mass media, which transforms its programs of advertising, entertainment, and redundant news, with a few exceptions of good programming, on our property, the public airway. And part of environmental sustainability is for us to realize from grade school that we are part owners in the greatest commonwealth in the world. One third of America, public lands, the public airways, we own them. The public works, the great dams, the navigable waterways, the canals, the massive research and development your tax dollars have paid for that have built the biotech industry much of the pharmaceutical industry, the semiconductor industry, the containerization industry, the construction material industry, the aerospace industry. All these industries who put ads in papers bragging as if it was their money that broke through. It was tax dollar money. I keep saying we should have a Taxpayer Appreciation Day on April 15th, where corporations pay their debt of gratitude to the taxpayers for making their industries possible. But if we knew what we own, we'll suddenly discover we don't control this. we we'll suddenly discover that massive wreckage of minerals in our public lands is due to an 1872 mining act that gives any foreign or domestic corporation that discovers on our lands with their geologists hard rock minerals like gold, silver, lead, and molybdenum, the ownership for five bucks an acre. A Canadian gold company discovers nine billion with a B dollars worth of gold a few years ago on public land in Nevada, our land, and they got it for $30,000. And no royalties back to the US government. And when they exhaust the mine, the cyanide and the waste, guess who cleans them up? So there's a broader awareness here of the kind of future we want for our country and our world. Are we up to it? Or are we going to just regale in the heroics of our forebears and not even be up to them? You can almost hear them crying out from the furies, crying out from the past to us. Finish the job. Complete the job. Advance the sustainability of the planet. That means we have to have that higher estimate of our own significance, each and every one of us, and not allow our lives to be excessively routinized and morbidly trivialized. Thank you very much.
In chapter 11, it states that um, hypothetical, I guess, is word, investments that are infringed on by the government, um, you know, the government needs to pay those hypothetical investments back to that corporation. Now, with the industrial hemp, what if there were a corporation that was set up and, you know, there are laws against that corporation, couldn't they then say that, you know, these laws infringe against us, so, you know, you need to pay us money back? So under Chapter 11, here's how it works. The Canadian company sells the chemical to the U.S. Uh, the government uh, passes a regulation banning it. Canadian company says that's a loss of business. They have to be compensated to a certain degree. They take us to the NAFTA courts. Uh, this is pretty wild because you can see there's a funeral chain that lost a big verdict in the southern state in the U.S. It's a Canadian chain, uh, 600,000 verdict for predatory practices against small funeral parlors. They are suing under 11, chapter 11 to vacate the jury verdict and the court decision. So this is this could be the final straw that could trip up NAFTA because uh, no country is going to permit its com uh, uh, companies in neighboring countries to challenge their uh, environmental regulation. A lot of these are still in the courts; they haven't been decided yet. But uh, if anything can dump NAFTA, it's uh, it's Chapter 11. But it just shows you how far things can go if the public is not alert because. I'm sure there wasn't anybody in Congress who had read that, and they just passed it. It was a close vote, by the way, but on that. Mr. Yeah. Nader, um, what would you say to the fact that international tribunals help prevent protectionism with the national governments? They help prevent what? Protectionism. As in how we are currently protecting the national coal in, or steel industry. Yeah, did you say international tribunals? Oh, you mean they, they oppose protectionism? Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, they can work that way. Uh, they have some interesting beneficial consequences, although the responses aren't. Like, uh, we give our U.S. companies abroad a big tax break. The Europeans brought um, a case under WTO saying that was an unfair trade practice, and they won in the tribunal, Geneva. So let's say that's a good thing, right? But so what happens? There's now winding through Congress a bill that replaces the tax credits, et cetera, with even bigger tax be uh, SKP benefits for these corporations. They get it one way or the other. On steel, that's not as easy call. That's a difficult call for Bush to have made. He made uh, th the question comes down to the following. The steel industry is expanding tremendously in China. There's huge overcapacity in steel in the world, and the prices are dropping to a point where we could lose our steel industry. So the question is, do we want a steel industry in the United States? Since a lot of things we need are made of steel. Uh, and if you're worried about national defense, do you want to import your steel from other companies, other countries? So there gets to be a national defense issue, a a labor protection issue, uh, and uh, Bush made what I think was the right call at the beginning. He reversed it a few months ago, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens. The steel industry is not the stick in the mud industry it once was. It's become more efficient in this country, largely through the product of imports. But now it's so shrunken that the question is whether we want a steel industry in our country. And that, that transcends uh, issues of import exports. There are a lot of other factors that we can see. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for coming to our school and talking to us. I really appreciate it. So, um, I just have a quick question. Um, you know, I, we got all these problems you know, in the world in general today and you know, a lot of issues to work out. But I think like the main problem, it seems, is that um, we have no like, way of you know, reaching everyone and you know making everyone aware of, of these issues specifically because I think a lot of our public airwaves have been are owned by Viacom, you know, General Electric and uh, News Corporation. So I was uh, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how we can how we can get back our media 
and that we can use our media to further yeah. make people aware. Actually, there's far more information than we're using. You can get it off the internet, you can get it in publications, you can get it sometimes on Jennings or Brokaw. Uh, there's far more information than we're using. What the media doesn't do is give us time to mobilize it. That is, they'll give us some horror story from some copper mine uh, contaminated town in Montana where people are dying and sick and uh, or the company in Ohio is buying out of town because it's so polluted they figure it's cheaper to buy the whole thing and bulldoze it and pay the owners, the homeowners, uh, for, for getting out. But they almost never uh, give us space to mobilize this. For example, they don't cover rallies very well, they don't cover congressional hearings on solutions very well, they don't cover Interface Corporation. Everybody knows Bill Gates, nobody knows Ray Anderson, see? So that's where I really fault the media. We're not getting, on our property, we're not able to use our property to mobilize ourselves. That's why we need to have our own audience network, our own radio and TV time, with our own studios. We're the landlords, we own the public areas. We don't have to give them 24 hours uh, control to these radio and TV stations. We can take back one hour, it's our property, condition the license, and uh, program anything we want to program. Do you know that the, the radio and TV stations pay no rent for this license? Hundreds of billions of dollars they've gotten from us since 1927 in free spectrum property. Can you imagine any business that would give away its property like that? But they make us, through the power in Washington, give it away. And we've got very nice proposals, right down to the drafted statute, on how to carve out a certain amount of time, drive time, prime time, for the people's studios, programmers, reporters, and station time. Now, has it ever occurred to you, you know, this idea I often talk about, about all of us growing up corporate instead of growing up civic, we look at the world through the dominant lenses of corporate advertising and propaganda. Let me ask you this. There are 15 million college and university community college students in this country and, and uh, graduate students. 15 million. That's double the population of Sweden. You don't have one 30-minute over-the-air weekly television program about all the exciting things that are going on campus, engineering, science, arts, literature, other than sports. You get plenty of air time in sports. Zero on everything else. Not one 30-minute program a week. Let me ask you this. How many of you ever thought of the point I just made? How many of you ever said, gee, you know, we don't even have our own program. We don't have our own cable channel. See, when you grow up corporate, your very imagination is stunted. I didn't think of it when I was in college. Never occurred to me. We had TV then. <laughs> <laughs> Never occurred to me. Never occurred. And what else isn't occurring to us? For instance, does it occur to you that you have 50, 100, 150 cable stations? And you have all kinds of necklace and bracelet selling stations and movie rewind stations and weather panels and, and uh, you know, bunny, uh, what do you call it, Playboy bunny stations and cartoon channels. I hear there's one coming uh, called the Chimp Channel, which is dressing up chimps in our clothes uh, as they prance around. And uh, sports rewind and, right, there's not a single civic action success channel. Well, we can say, hey, we got a problem here. They fixed it in Toledo or they fixed it in Seattle. Let's learn from them. We got phone numbers, you know, websites, and so on. No, nothing. So our very expectation level goes down. That's a form of control. Just keep your expectation level down, and they can laugh all the way to the back, as the proverbial phrase puts it. That's why. If you were part of my suggestion, you need a citizen skill course here at Hamilton. Very few colleges have it. You learn computer skills and engineering skills and marketing skills, and business administration skills. You need a, a citizen skill course connecting classroom with community so you can practice democracy, learn all the 
how to use the Free Information Act, how to put on a news conference, how to put a coalition together, how to keep your spirits up, how to be resilient when you lose, bounce back, be more creative. So I'm going to leave in the library this book that we put together for that topic called Civics for Democracy, A Journey for Teachers and Students on the civic history, civic uh, performances that are going on around the country, and the tools of democracy that we have to learn. The tools, we, know we have the rights. The rights without the tools aren't very usable. The free information law is a tool, for example. Uh, the right to form trade union is a tool, for instance. By the way, I understand we don't have all that many, but there are some out there. Whoever's got the books out there, uh, it's told us he's got some of these books. And give me what your textbooks sell for. This is a real bargain. <laughs> but if you want to get a student committee together on a citizen skill course, you'll find a lot of your professors would love it. Lots of good materials, newsletters, pamphlets, how to put on a news conference, and, and web material. You don't have to build a new lab, you have to build a new building. Uh, but you come out of Hamilton, you know how to operate in a democratic society. You don't go around saying you can't fight City Hall or Exxon or Merck, Sharp, and Dome. You, you've got certain skills. How many of you would be interested to take such a course? Why not, right? You want to be powerless all your life? Of course, it's a fun course. You, you learn about the world around you. And you learn about the history, as well as what, how people have succeeded over overwhelming uh, odds. So I'll leave this at, at, on reserve at the library. Maybe your student newspaper will uh, write it up. You know, when again in your life, unless you're lucky, are you ever going to have your own gathering halls, your own chemistry lab, your own physics lab? When are you ever going to have your own radio station, your own newspaper? Take advantage of it. Sometimes you're too close to it, you don't appreciate it. Take advantage of it. You have your own radio station? Yeah. yeah. See? So, you're just playing music? <laughs> I want to have some of these great debates among Hell and Tony. Okay, why well, don't we take two last questions here? Mr. Nader, you uh, talk a lot about sustainability for the Earth. <laughs> I was just wondering uh, what you would say to the claims of um, economists and uh, environmental cornucopia and Simon who says that all of the Earth's uh, resources and non-renewable ones are becoming more abundant as uh, we go on. Yes, uh, he made the claim that uh, things are getting better. We have more forest coverage in the U.S. now than we had 150 years ago without distinguishing between the difference ecologically become virgin forest and regrowth forest. Anybody who's been through New England <laughs> knows the big difference between the forest has been cut down and then pops up again in a random way, uh, and that's to around the country. Um, <clears throat> the problem with Simon is he was never rebutted because the other side uh, patronized him and thought he was so nutty that he wasn't worth rebutting. Uh, he, he put forth the strongest case for his point, and he should have been treated uh, more seriously. Uh, is there more soil erosion now and more timber loss in tropical forests than 50 years ago? Absolutely. Is there more uh, ozone depletion uh, chemicals going up than 50 years ago? Absolutely. It, do we have the first decline in fish catches uh, in the last six, seven years since we started thinking about fish catches in the ocean? Absolutely. On and on. Now, he would come and say, don't worry, human ingenuity will take care of this. Well, of course. Isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't that what we're talking about? That human ingenuity by getting solar energy and getting more sustainable agricultural pro projects and so forth. So I don't know what his final point is. Of course, human ingenuity. That doesn't mean that things are not getting worse. That doesn't mean that we should be morbidly pessimistic. Uh, but it does mean that we shouldn't be complacent. Because things are getting worse in many ways. More people died last year from the disease of poverty, tuberculosis, than in any time in history. Even though we have the cures for it since the 1950s, the DOCS treatments, and so forth. What are we doing here? We have far more knowledge than we are applying. You've just come up with a case, haven't you, among students, tuberculosis. It's heading in this country in drug resistant form. It's coming back. 
That's really good. Mr. Dater, early on in your speech you asked on why tax income. I was wondering if you could elaborate on a, a different system to replace the federal income tax. Yes. And also I was on wondering if you were planning on that. <laughs> I, um, that, that will be decided one way or the other this month. I think a very, very important that the two parties uh, are, are prodded, challenged, uh, demonstrated uh, as to what they should be like. And I don't like the idea of a two-party monopoly. Uh, other, other I especially don't like the arrogance of two-party adherence who try to say to millions of voters who might vote for other candidates that they shouldn't have the opportunity to do so because these votes belong to one or two of the other parties they're entitled to. That's how deep the ingrained uh, agenda is in <laughs> On the tax issue, see this is where a presidential campaign should have a great debate on tax issues. For instance, there are trillions of dollars turned over every week in stocks, bonds, and derivatives. Now, suppose we put a penny tax on every stock, bond, and derivative that's traded that hasn't been held for more than six months. What would that raise? Go, go to your calculators. Hundreds of billions of dollars and it would dampen speculation to some degree. But even if it doesn't, isn't it better to do that? You go into a store here in New York. Is there a sales tax here on furniture, clothing? Uh, not on food, right? But, but a lot of things, right? Give me three examples. Clothing. Okay. All right, you go in. Stereos, appliances. Right. Now, look, look at the difference. You go into more and you buy uh, a bureau or a stereo or a car, you pay a sales. What is it, 6%? Eight. Eight. Now, some big operator in Wall Street tomorrow buys 100,000 shares of General Motors. Zero. Sales tax. Zero. So, uh, why the difference? Just because they're more powerful, that's why. Why tax income when you can tax these things that we are nowhere near as important in terms of incentives? And some of them are things we'd like to do less of, like pollution. That's one. The second is, any of you ever read Henry George, the great economist in the latter part of the 19th century? You should read that book. It's very current. He believes if you tax the unearned income on real estate valuations, you would not only have some beneficial social effects, but you'd raise a lot of money. For instance, in Washington, someone says, let's build a subway. The taxpayer builds a subway. Suddenly, the value is triple of the property along that subway or near that subway station. Why shouldn't that be taxed? Well, you think there are problems in working that out? He worked it out. He is Michael Kinsley's favorite economist, according to Michael Kinsley. Something we should discuss. The other thing is, why don't we have a tax on wealth? You know, the only tax we have on wealth is your home, your building, and your estate. Now, the Republicans want to get rid of the estate tax. This is really bizarre. If you had a choice between taxing the living and the dead, which would you take? <laughs> the latter doesn't feel it. There's this long progressive rationale for the estate tax. It's a sociological rationale. That you, you try to level the playing field between the descendants of the rich and the rest. You also, you also do the, the uh, first generation a favor because it spoils their descendants. They get too much money. Uh, two facts. The old story, uh, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Uh, so the argument is by people like Saul Price, who started Price Clubs, which is now Costco. He's a multi-millionaire. He's probably worth five, four or five hundred million dollars. He wants a one percent tax on wealth. 
Not a, nowhere near enough to drive it out of the country, but enough to replace the tax on someone who's making 30000 or 35000 or 25000 a year and trying to eke out a living. Now, there's a responsible man. Uh, there are a thousand very rich people who have formed a coalition to, to stop the uh, forthcoming abolition of the estate tax. The other thing is when these people want to abolish the estate tax, they never talk about what's going to take its place. Oh, are you going to cut the military budget? Oh, heavens no. Don't cut the military budget when we have no more major enemy in the world? What are you, out of your mind? <laughs> Over half of the federal budget's discretionary expenditures, setting aside Social Security and Medicare, half, over half now is military. There's no more Soviet Union. Communist China is moving as fast as possible from criminal communism to criminal capitalism. <laughs> See, it's become an entrenched uh, military-industrial complex. The words that President Eisenhower warned us about in his farewell address in uh, 1953, January. So we have to talk about these things and not let a few people uh, with lobbyists swarming all over them on Capitol Hill, which we now call Withering Heights, to, uh, <laughs> to make those decisions for us. By the way, that, that, those uh, sign-ups, if you, if, you if you want forgot them or they won't buy you, are they going to be, they'll be right here. Isn't that a cozy little thing? <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be right here. Uh, so look, if, if, I know you have to get back to your studies and so on, but if you want to chat, I'm willing to go on. If you want to chat, if you want to chat here, uh, as you come by, uh, and if you have any other questions, and, uh, if you want more information, three quick websites. Essential.org is one. Citizen.org, if you want health care, Congress, energy. Citizen.org, Essential.org. And on corporate crime and reform, the corporate crime wave that's looted and drained trillions of dollars from innocent workers, small investors, and pension holders in the last three years. Can you imagine that? Trillions of dollars. And only a handful of those corporate crooks have gone to jail. You can uh, sign up for a free electronic newsletter on developments in this field by logging into citizenworks.org. One word, citizenworks.org. And just sign up for the electronic newsletter. Okay? Thank you. Thank you all.